Good afternoon from Scotts Valley, California. My name is Kate Green Tripp, and I'm coming to you live from the teaching kitchen at 1440 Multiversity. Joining me today is Dr. Judson Brewer, psychiatrist, author, and thought leader in the field of addiction and habit change. Judson is both faculty here at 1440 Multiversity, as well as the Director of Research and Innovation at Brown University's Mindfulness Center, along with being plenty of other things, I can assure you. He's a fascinating guy. And his work sheds light on how and why we as human creatures get so caught up in cycles of craving and habit and addiction. So Judson, welcome. Thanks for having me. It's always a pleasure to have you. So let's let's talk about these nasty cycles, mm -hmm. habits in particular. I know we were curious to kind of kick that off. How how do we form habits, and why is it that they're so hard to break? Both great questions. I think the first one related to how do we form them goes way back in evolutionary time, so to speak, where. We form habits as a way to remember where food is. It's called reward-based learning or operant conditioning, or even, you know, um, we can think of this as context-dependent memory formation, which is just a mouthful for saying, you know, when we find food and it gives us calories, our stomach sends a signal to our brain that says, remember what you ate and where you found it. Uh, so there are three core elements, a trigger, a behavior, and a reward. And if those three are, are in place, then we form a habit. Uh, and so, you know, it's, it's essential for survival to remember where to get food. So it's a good thing. We want to remember where to get food, but we don't necessarily want to do some of the other stuff that we find ourselves doing in, in the, certainly this day and age. Yes, it's a good thing until it's not. <laughs> As in when we're not hungry, but we use the same reward-based learning system to stress eat or even perpetuate cycles of anxiety. You know, anxiety doesn't typically help us survive, but our brain doesn't know the difference. So that brain circuitry, trigger, behavior, reward, it's like that's the correct order, Yeah, is just hardwired in us. It's hardwired, yeah. And that's what makes them so hard to break when we apply that to something that may not be serving us in the way food does, finding food does. Yes. Yeah. One way to think of this is that's a very old part of the brain and the old part of the brain is kind of the strongest. It's what we fall back to when the younger parts or the newer parts of our brain aren't working so well. For example, when we're stressed out. <laughs> so when we're stressed, the newer parts like the prefrontal cortex, which is involved in thinking and planning and, for example, restricting ourselves. So, you know, that's the part of the brain that says, oh, you should eat salad before you eat dessert. And when we're stressed out, our old brain says, screw that, I'm going right for dessert. I might not survive dinner. So that's an interesting segue to this idea of willpower that many of us are used to thinking as the appropriate response to a bad habit. So does willpower work? It works for Mr. Spock, as in the guy from Star Trek that didn't have any emotions, you know, um, who also, I think he was famous for saying many things, but one of them was saying, you know, highly illogical captain when he was talking to Captain Kirk. Um, and Captain Kirk was usually running around like a chicken with his head cut off <laughs> being very emotional. <laughs> so for, for people, or for more precisely for Vulcans, um, who are people that don't have, you know, or who have very strong self-control, let's say, uh, this works really, really well because they don't get caught up or blindsided or blinded literally by their emotions. But for the rest of us, which is most of us, uh, that you know that thinking part of our brain is a newer part, and it goes offline when we get stressed out. So the stress happens, the emotional feeling arrives, and then we get into that loop that we just talked about. Yes. Uh, that may be the trigger, the emotional, whatever it is. Yes, and so we could even use as an example, stress could be a trigger for all sorts of things. So stress could trigger us to eat. So we stress eat and we learn, oh, I get that dopamine hit from sugar. And then that teaches me, oh, when you're stressed out, you should eat. Or stress could also lead to a worry thought loop where it says, oh, I'm stressed. I got to figure this out. And so we start worrying, which is kind of this, this cheap date for 
um, trying to feel like we're in control, even though it doesn't really, you know, worry doesn't generally solve problems. But that feeling of control or even a little bit of distraction from the stress um, kind of feeds back and says, oh, keep worrying, which can lead to the, uh, the, the constant worrier, so to speak. Yeah, I've heard you talk about worry being this thing that maybe we visit enough times that we somehow feel like the worrying does something. So then when the trigger arrives, we return to worry. Yes. It's sort of a safe zone. It is. And, and, you know, occasionally it's like winning the lottery. Occasionally we'll, we'll feel like we're in control or we'll problem solve when we're worrying. And then our brain says, oh, jackpot, you know, you should worry more. <laughs> Just, so we could play the lottery, but the majority of us don't win. And the same thing is true for the worry lottery. I wouldn't recommend playing that one. That's <laughs> I agree. <laughs> So, so let's talk about something that we see and certainly experience. I know I do. Um, in our in our daily life, where habit or um, kicks in, thinking in particular of social media um, and being on our phone, just that instinctive, reactive behavior that we all do of picking up and swiping and checking and doing. Let's talk about that. Yes. How so, do we deal with that addiction? How do we how do we handle that? Well, the first step is to really understand how it comes about. And I like this phrase, I think that Cornell West uh, developed. It's, he calls these these weapons of mass distraction. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Isn't that great? These wow. weapons of mass distraction. And so the idea is understanding how it happens in the first place. So we get stressed out. Stress doesn't feel good. We go to our phone, we swipe, you know, and the average person swipes thousands of times a day. So we swipe and whether it's cute puppy videos or checking our newsfeed or checking whatever, um, that distraction is this brief relief that we get from the stress or the anxiety or whatever it is, or even just boredom, you know, oh, suddenly boredom feels like we're in the hot seat and it used to just be boredom. But now it's like, well, I can, I can alleviate this with, by pulling out my phone. Right. So step one is really just understanding how the process works so that it's not a black box. That's interesting what you say about boredom. So that boredom almost has become a trigger, whereas previously in a different time in our society, in our culture, in our behavior, it wasn't a trigger. It was just something we allowed for. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, for example, if you're driving around at night and you pull up to a stoplight and you look around, you know how many people have these like glowing crotches because they're like they can't. <laughs> They can't stop at a stoplight and wait 30 seconds. <laughs> They're all pulling out their phones as compared to just sitting there. Right. So what's the tr so what's the trick? What's the what's the million dollar answer? I know there's you know I'm I'm asking that in jest, but yeah. What how what do we inject into this equation to help us? So after step one, recognizing and really identifying the habit loop and seeing oh here's my brain at play again. Step two is really exploring, well, what am I getting from this? And what that does is help a part of our brain called the orbitofrontal cortex really evaluate how rewarding this behavior is. Because if it's not that rewarding and we see that it's not that rewarding, we become less excited to do it. Mm -hmm. So that's step two. And then that opens up space for step three, which is to bring in what I think of as the BBO, the bigger, better offer where we bring in something more rewarding. So for example, if we're at a stoplight and we're bored for 30 seconds <laughs> and we can't sit with ourselves, that feels uncomfortable. Oh, I'm, I'm restless. We, and the, the old habit is to pull out our phone. We can stop and notice, oh, I pulled out my phone and I started swiping. What do I get from this? And just see, you know, is this really that rewarding? As, or is this just, you know, pressing me to, be that rat pressing levers for food. Um, so from there, we can then say, well, let me compare this to simply dropping in and maybe being aware. Like, let me look around. And if we're in, you know, not in the middle of the city, we might just look around and notice the trees or we might notice, you know, what's outside and just get really curious about what we're looking at. Mm -hmm. Or we might even just drop into our body and check in out. What's my body feel like right now? And we can see just by bringing simple mindfulness practices in, 
that mindfulness actually feels quite a bit better than like frantically swiping at our phone, hoping that nobody behind us is going to honk because they see that we're swiping our phone and all this stuff that comes with these, you know, these brief relief things that actually are just perpetuating uh, habits that, that are making us even more frantic. So it's pretty simple, three-step process. Absolutely true. It's all about taking the time and, and the moment to notice, as you say, get curious about how it actually feels to do it. Judd, it's always a pleasure to talk with you. Thank you for giving us a little corner of your day. Um, again, Dr. Judson Brewer, 1440 Multiversity Faculty, incredible thought leader in this in this ever increasingly important range of thinking about habit behavior addiction and how mindfulness plays a key role thank you my pleasure bye bye <laughs>